Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for this web chat with Dr. Ted Shetler, the author of the recently released book, The Ecology of Breast Cancer, The Promise of Prevention, and the Hope for Healing. Dr. Shetler is science director for two different programs, the Science and Environmental Health Network and the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. And wanted to let you know that the book is available for download on the SEHN website or if you want a hard copy it's available for a very reasonable price on Amazon.com. The goal here is to get this information out and getting folks talking about this great work. Um, so I am very excited to be um, talking about this book. It's really engaging reading, definitely worth a look and very much on the cutting edge of thinking about the complexities inherent in breast cancer and preventing breast cancer. So it's most excellent and thank you for being with us, Ted. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Connie. Absolutely. So we have a very short 25-minute window here for a chat, so we'll wrap up no later than 4.30, possibly um, a little bit before that. And I'd love to start at the beginning. So how did you start applying ecological concepts, which you know we often think about as ecological models in the environment, to what we know and even what we don't know about breast cancer? Well, a number of years ago, it began, began to seem to me that ecological concepts are useful for thinking about a number of complex diseases in which multiple multi-level variables are involved, variables that collectively interact and create system conditions that make a disease more or less likely. And I thought breast cancer was a good example of a complex disease where those uh, criteria really sort of apply. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for example, for breast cancer, patterns of the disease in populations of people simply are not well explained by looking at individual known risk factors in isolation and then sort of adding them up. And rather, it seemed to me that we needed to begin to think more about interactions across the entire life course and how those interactions, which are really primary phenomena, actually influence system conditions in ways that make the disease more or less likely. And, and it seemed to me that this is precisely the kind of, 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 uh, of, of analysis that ecologists bring to their work when they begin to think about what makes an ecosystem more or less resilient. What, wow. makes, what makes an ecosystem more or less vulnerable to being perturbed either by something coming in from the outside or, or from something that arises on the inside of that system. Uh, and so I started to think that if we, if we began to use that language, began to use those concepts, began to allow those ideas to uh, influence the way we design studies of breast cancer origins, and mm -hmm. I should add also about the response to treatment and prognosis as well that we might actually learn, have some new insights that we weren't getting from the way we were thinking about uh, this disease traditionally. So that's, that's why I began to, to explore this idea of applying ecological concepts uh, to breast cancer more fully. Wow, that's actually a great answer and very interesting and inspiring. Um, I want to make sure that we define some terms before we get too far into the conversation. So some of the terms that you use in the book and really in this field at large have multiple definitions. Can you take a moment to describe how you define two key terms, um, first environment and second prevention? Well, for me, uh, environment uh, involves uh, many variables, uh, the physical, biologic, uh, nutritional, social uh, environments in all their dimensions. Um, uh -huh. And they interact uh, between and among themselves and they interact uh, with individuals and families and communities of people. And all of this is happening against, of course, a genetic background, and those various environmental variables influence gene expression and so on. Uh, but 
uh, I think it's, for me at least, it was important to recognize the complexity of the environment, even though when we study it, we have to tease that apart a little bit and begin to look at individual components of the environment, but never forgetting that they're part of, of the larger environment. And I might add to that that, that it is also multi-level in the sense that if we think about the individual as being a member of a family and of a community mm -hmm. and of an ecosystem, this sort of nested phenomenon that's very traditional in ecological analyses, there are community level variables as well. So there are things like, uh, there are things like for example, the, the safety of a neighborhood. Uh, that is a neighborhood level variable. It's, it's, it's not an individual level variable. There are things like the accessibility of food in a neighborhood that uh, is, again, a, a community level variable and not an individual level variable. So it, it begins to invite us to think uh, across these levels. Not that one is more important than the other, but these nested uh, levels exist and we begin to think about how we design studies around it. The second term you asked me about is prevention and I, I use a fairly traditional public health set of definitions where I think of primary prevention as, as efforts to try to prevent the onset of the disease even at its earliest stages so that uh, there may be biologic phenomena, biologic markers, biologic pathways that get initiated that over time might lead to a disease like breast cancer. Opportunities for primary prevention are way upstream to try to prevent those uh, pathologic processes from even beginning long before uh, a, a tumor might appear. Secondary prevention is typically thought about as efforts to try to prevent a, a disease once it's been established from progressing. Uh, so there are multiple levels of prevention, but I was particularly interested in primary prevention of, of breast cancer. Absolutely, as are we. Those um, early, early stages not only let us really prevent all the sequelae of the disease, but also often give us clues much earlier in the string of disease factors that might lead us to make changes and sometimes it seems that um, researching some of those early cellular stages, cellular changes, responses to estrogenic chemicals are a little bit easier to elucidate research-wise early on as well. I agree with that and I, I think that uh, I, I cited some studies of, of findings in, in mammography that was done in two different populations of people uh, as well as some of the information we have for example about DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ where there are good reasons to believe that for some people uh, either early stages of the disease simply don't progress for some people or in some cases there's actually spontaneous regression. Mm -hmm. So what what is it about those those individual people that popu population of people that influences the progression of the early stages of the disease? And you know, early in um, some of the laboratory research uh, of of breast cancer, there was a scientist who 75 years ago, uh, Charles Huggins was his name, and I talk about him a bit in the book, uh, developed the first. Uh, animal model for breast cancer in which he used a chemical to induce breast cancer. But over his career as he was using that model to study the disease he came to the conclusion and he actually said this in his uh, Nobel laureate acceptance speech. He talked about the importance of the soil as well as the importance of the tumor. In other words this, hmm. he, he used that metaphorically the idea that the tumor was located in a larger context, what he called the soil, and that the soil was terribly important in terms of whether that tumor was going to progress or not. And it seems to me that's, that's a very ecological uh, observation, that, uh, that you can think about the mutated cancer cell and the, and the, and the, the tumor, but it has to be uh, in an environment that allows it to progress. And if we expand that kind of thinking to the individual and to the community, uh, 
we begin to think about this as a public health problem. How could we design interventions and changes at the community level that would make it less likely that the early initiated tumor would be less likely to progress? Uh, so I, I think that uh, when we begin to think that way and we begin to think about prevention in that way, suddenly a whole uh, constellation of opportunities open up to us. Absolutely, and, and it really struck me as you were talking about some of the family and community and neighborhood factors that, of course, those um, sometimes also share causes or, how would you say it, like contexts in common, so that if you have a neighborhood um, that's, you know, besieged by a fair bit of, of violence, you have the stresses of living in that environment, as well as perhaps um, a setting where people can't be physically as active, um, where you might also have environmental chemical pollutants in that, that setting as well, so that it's not just an addition of individual risk factors that one individual might encounter, but that they are actually linked and kind of move together. They do, and I think you've just uh, described beautifully why we need to think about system conditions. I mean, we can talk about the individual variables that you just described, but you've also pointed out that that they they can't in some ways they're not separable, um, and that and that they collectively create system conditions. And I would add to to that that we're not only talking about system conditions that might promote the development and progression of breast cancer, but think about the other diseases and disorders of our time that are also related to that same set of system conditions. So that if we begin to think about ways to redesign, and that's why at some level I've called breast cancer a design problem, to try to get us to think about how we might redesign uh, the, these collective variables in ways that not only make breast cancer less likely, but that make other diseases and disorders uh, less likely as well, that emerge out of that same set of system conditions. Absolutely. Other cancers, reproductive health issues, cardiovascular issues, they share a lot of commonalities in terms of some of these very big picture causal factors. They do, and I agree. So I want to turn just to, for a moment. So a lot of our viewers today are folks who know the Breast Cancer Fund pretty well. And um, our work really focuses on the chemical and radiation exposures linked to breast cancer, certainly in the context of both how those exposures come to happen, whether that's people's neighborhoods, their occupations, um, the, the products that they use, but also how they interact and mix with other kinds of exposures and settings. So if we do think for just a moment about some of the specific chemicals and physical factors that are risk factors for breast cancer, what are some of them that you would really highlight and that you covered in your book? Well, I, uh, I mentioned the things that, for example, the Institute of Medicine Review uh, identified as clearly linked to breast cancer, things like uh, excessive alcohol consumption, tobacco smoke, current use of oral contraceptives, combination hormone replacement therapies. Mm -hmm. These links are fairly well established. Um, and then, as pointed out by the Institute of Medicine, but by many others as well, there are uh, additional chemicals that are for which the evidence is becoming stronger. Certain solvents, uh, particularly chlorinated solvents, uh, have been implicated in a number of, of studies now. Uh, ethylene oxide, which is an industrial chemical to which certain uh, women are, are more likely exposed in certain uh, occupational settings than in others, like nurses, for example, might be exposed to ethylene oxide, which is, cl is clearly carcinogenic and probably a breast carcinogen. There are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are a result of incomplete combustion of, of fossil fuels to which we're all exposed, and some other industrial chemicals like 1,3-butadiene, uh, for which the evidence is also uh, growing. There are some epidemiologic studies that point to certain professions like, for example, autom automotive plastics workers who are exposed to a whole 
uh, mixture of different industrial chemicals in their work where there's a, a st increasingly strong evidence. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, that it's useful also to think about how the context in which those chemicals land uh, uh, mm -hmm. might influence their the capacity to uh, uh, increase breast cancer risk. Unfortunately, we don't have much in the way of human studies along these lines yet, but if you look at animal data, you find that this life course approach where you look at mixtures of risk factors uh, together offers a lot of interesting insights. So for example, I cite a number of studies in the book where uh, a particular kind of diet uh, in pregnant uh, laboratory rodents uh, during pregnancy, uh, high levels of omega-6 fatty acids, make the female offspring more susceptible to mammary gland cancer in adulthood after, ex after they're exposed to a mammary gland carcinogen. Now, that brings in both the interaction of nutrition and environmental chemicals, mm -hmm. as well as the importance of the life course. And so, uh, fortunately, we're now beginning to see more and more attention paid to the life course analysis, and people are beginning to really emphasize the need of looking at the effect of environmental chemicals and what happens when the exposure occurs, for example, in utero or in infancy, uh, and in the pre uh, pre-pubertal uh, time when the tissues are just developing and their development can be influenced by chemical exposures, making them more likely to develop breast cancer later. So th it's one reason why I'm terribly concerned about bisphenol A exposures in the human population right now because we know that bisphenol A crosses the placenta. We've, we have studies in humans showing that you can measure free, active, biologically active bisphenol A in both uh, uh, amniotic fluid and umbilical cord blood. So we know that the fetus is being exposed, and if you look at animal data, they show that early life exposures to bisphenol A increases the risk of breast cancer, mammary gland cancer later. So this is not, uh, th this is a very disturbing uh, uh, observation, uh, particularly since uh, virtually all of us are exposed to bisphenol A at some level. So I think the chemical story is emerging in combination with some of these others that's really inviting new kinds of study designs and looking across the life course. Great answer. That's so, so wonderful. And um, I don't know if you saw our report, Disrupted Development, but we looked at the prenatal exposures to bisphenol A in humans as well as the um, small but growing epidemiological evidence it, about human um, in utero exposures as well as the animal evidence across really different health effects. And it's one another one of these where um, in utero BPA exposures are linked to um, potential increases in mammary gland cancers and, and breast cancer. We extrapolate from the animal studies, but um, to a lot of other issues as well, number of studies showing altered brain development and behavior in um, children, in human children, as a result of those exposures. So we'd be doing ourselves a big favor if we took that seriously for mammary glands as well as other health issues. Yes, I agree with that. It raises interesting questions about when, uh, in this complexity that we're talking about, uh, the ecological framework uh, doesn't lend itself to a complete understanding of, of definitive cause and effect relationships in, in great granular detail out to mm -hmm. the fourth decimal point. Uh, nor does an ecological analysis do that for anyone else. I mean, that's just the nature of ecological sciences. You can mm -hmm. talk about the probability of certain outcomes, but uh, you can't you can't talk with with great confidence that a, a system will behave in a certain way. They're probabilistic. They're not deterministic systems, and so our challenge here is to try to figure out how to create uh, health protective public policy in the face of this complexity. Yes, and um, as you know, really, as you were talking about the evidence on chemical exposures. You know, much of it is emerging. It's it's actually changing and growing quite rapidly. 
both in terms of what we know about health outcomes, um, the kind that are observable either in, in human or animal experimental research, um, but also the kinds that we can see linked to um, sometimes earlier changes, the kinds of things that you can study in cell culture, the kinds of things that you can um, estimate from you know the structure of a chemical, but at the same time it becomes very difficult to um, causally test those, so we have to be able to move forward with public health actions when we start building a case, you know, for concern. That's right. I mean, it is a weight of evidence approach where you see that a chemical in a test tube study, for example, might initiate a biologic pathway that you know is somehow associated with increased breast cancer risk. Uh, and you begin to put that together with animal data and so forth and then you ask yourself at some point what would it take to really uh, analyze uh, the breast cancer risk in adult women for example as a function of their bisphenol A exposure in, in utero or any, uh, any other chemical of concern and the answer is we're never going to get those kinds of studies it is never going to be done we're never going to be able to link breast cancer in a a 40 or a 50 year old woman or a group of 40, 50 year old women with in utero exposures to a particular chemical because of so many interceding other variables that are involved. Nutritional, uh, uh, exercise, uh, genetic uh, stress and social circumstances and so on. So then the, the science runs into its limits and then the science at some point this becomes a political question. At what point does the policy response uh, uh, reflect the best that we can do and what we know at the time in order to be health protective? And I think that that's a very important conversation to have, uh, but I think it, it, it points out to us that establishing these cause and effect relationships of certainty is always going to be difficult, if not impossible. Yes, and, and another thing that you said, you know, and it's true for BPA, but it's true for a number of the other exposures that we encounter is there's often no unexposed group. So you can't compare the group of people who encounter an exposure to the group of people who don't if you don't have a group of people who don't. Exactly, and that's that really is the fix we find ourselves in for for many, uh, uh, and that you know this is true not only for chemical exposures but it's true across studies of nutrition and exercise mm -hmm. and so on, that uh, that finding groups that have different uh, whose whose diets are different enough over the lifespan. Uh, mm -hmm can make it difficult to tease out some of these observations. And what we're learning, by the way, with respect to diet and nutrition is that that early life diet probably matters even more than uh, diet during adulthood. Uh, in other words, even the nutritional literature now is beginning to see the importance of taking a look at the life course, the, the lifetime uh, dietary patterns as opposed to just beginning to look in adulthood. And so that would have very important implications, I would think, for how we design research studies. I think it has enormous uh, implications, and and I think that what I come away from this analysis with is beginning to think about all of the opportunities for breast cancer prevention that must begin uh, even preconception. And I say mm -hmm. preconception because uh, uh, mothers and fathers environments and, and habits and behaviors and so on have influenced the quality of uh, not only the intrauterine environment but also epigenetic markers on germ cells mm -hmm. and, 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 how, and how genes might express themselves. We know now that they're probably not all sort of erased back to, to, to zero at the time of, of conception. Uh, but even if we begin with conception, the intrauterine environment is terribly important in terms of influencing disease risk. That That is a message that is coming out whether we're looking at cancer or cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, and uh, uh, stroke, uh, hypertension, and so on. Uh, 
uh, the importance of the intrauterine environment. I think that the opportunities for breast cancer prevention begin early and they need to be thought about across the life uh, course and we need to be thinking about what are, what are our children eating, what are we feeding our infants, uh, uh, when do we begin to uh, look at the whole issue of exercise and physical activity and establish healthy patterns that will then uh, be carried into uh, adolescence and adulthood uh, so that we, we truly take sort of a comprehensive life course approach uh, to breast cancer prevention and as I said I think if we do that we'll find that we're going to have beneficial effects for a number of other chronic diseases and disorders as well. Most excellent and I think that it's nice to end on that um, very hopeful note that you know there are changes we can make at a policy level and an individual level and so I'm going to ask you a hard question and I'm going to make it hard mostly in the interest of our viewers time but um, you know, what does the current body of research suggest that either individuals can do to reduce their risk or that the risk of their offspring, and um, the kinds of policies that could, you know, really set up a context where maybe the individual doesn't even have to make that decision because the context is so much more health promotive. Well, it's a great question, and we probably don't have time to go into great detail. But I would refer uh, listeners to to chapter eight in the in the book, in which I go through the various uh, risk factors and talk about what I think individuals can do. I didn't spend a lot of time on the traditional risk factors. Uh, I, uh, you know, I didn't. I mean, smoking, avoiding smoking, and and limiting alcohol intake uh, are some fairly obvious things. But but the dietary uh, what we know about diet and breast cancer risk uh, is laid out there. There's a healthy diet, and I I, I might say it would it, that diet would be healthy for a lot of reasons in addition to breast cancer prevention. Uh, we we really need to build exercise and physical activity into our lives more generally, starting very early. So what are the what what are our obligations to our children in their schools? How do we build more physical activity and exercise into the school curriculum? We know that it only not only helps reduce disease risk, but it actually improves academic performance and achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what what's the message to our children when the first thing that gets cut under budgetary constraints from a, a school program is physical education? Uh, there's some information in there about vitamin D status and how we ought to optimize it without going overboard. Uh, there's some information about stress reduction, particularly uh, as part of an integrated approach to breast cancer treatment after the diagnosis and initial treatment that uh, listeners might find uh, find useful as well. Um, but I, I do think, and, uh, and there's an interesting story in Chapter 1 about the North Karelia project in Finland in which community level interventions were used along with attempts to try to in influence individual behavior to reduce cardiovascular mortality in Finland back in the 1970s and 80s when it was the highest in the world and hmm. by using by using this combination of not only individual behavioral uh, education and attempts to improve uh, to reduce risk factors but applying them at the community level I mean that what was what, what was new about it a role for the media a role for supermarkets, a role for food manufacturers, a role for uh, community planners and designers that when, when this was all put together they actually reduced cardiovascular mortality uh, in that population by 84 percent over about a 15 year period. Uh, so it's a demonstration of how not only changes at the individual level but also at the community and population level can have profound effects on, on, on public health. And I think we can take lessons from that and apply it to this disease and begin to imagine together, figure out ways that we can make changes in our communities that will address this truly as a public health problem and not just an individual disease or disorder. Excellent. Um, the only thing I would really add to what you said is also, you know, changes into the chemical exposures that we face as a result of products that we use and what's in the environment to build that into 
the piece of both individual actions but community actions as well. So that if community we community actions as well and chemical policy reform. Yep. Most certainly. Uh, re reform at both the federal and state levels so that we, just as you've said, we, we create a regulatory regime which will uh, uh, move us toward safer chemicals in consumer products. Uh, it, all, it isn't all going to be done by regulation, but there's a real role for regulation here as well as market-based reforms that I think we ought to push for at the same time. Absolutely. Most certainly. It was great talking to you, Ted. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, everyone viewing this will be available as a recorded version um, in the next couple of days on our YouTube channel. Check out Ted's book on the Science and Environmental Health Network pages. It is an excellent, um, very captivating and easy to read book that will give you all sorts of insights and thought-provoking discussions. Take care. Thank you, Ted. Thank you.